All right, it seems that we are now live, which is excellent. Everything's looking good. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Runners High, presented by Canada Running Series. Runners High is a collection of informal conversations with key and influential members of the world and business of running. My name is Kate Van Buskirk, and I am very honored to once again be your host for today's discussion. And this is a very special edition of Runners High. Firstly, we are now halfway through what would have been our Scotiabank Toronto Waterfront Marathon Race Week. So, you know, usually this time of year, the Canada Running Series crew is going full steam with final preparations for the expo, they're engaging with the media, and taking care of the seemingly endless pieces that to go into putting on a world-class marathon in a world-class city. And of course, nothing about this week looks like what it normally would. Um, you know, one of the perks, though, about having to do everything virtual is that our uh, STWM weekend has now become an STWM month. And this means that you still have time to register for the race of your choice and complete your virtual event through the second half, half of October. You can do this by visiting torontowaterfrontmarathon.com, where along with checking out our social media channels, you'll find all kinds of great info about our virtual speaker series and the AC 42K Relay Challenge taking place this weekend. But of course, this episode of Runners High is doubly special. I'm grinning here, as I'm sure you've all ascertained from our screen, our shared screen, because we have two superstar guests joining us, and both should be very familiar to our audience. Our first guest is the author of several number one best-selling books, including his most recent publication, Talking to Strangers. He's the host of the Revisionist History podcast and the co-founder of Pushkin Industries, and he is a lifelong runner. Mr. Malcolm Gladwell, we are thrilled to welcome you to Runners High. Thank you so much for being with us today. And Thank you. And our second guest today is the former Canadian 1500 meter record holder. He competed in the first ever World Track and Field Championships. And more recently, he is known as a close friend of the Scotiabank Toronto Waterfront Marathon team. And I'm honored to call him my personal coach, Mr. Dave Reed. Hi, Dave. How are you? Great to have you on. Mm -hmm. So gentlemen, this is a conversation that I have wanted to have for a very long time. And I'm beyond excited that we were able to find the time in both of your very busy schedules to make this happen. And so just before we get into it, I do want to remind our audience that Runners High is interactive. We've already received a number of questions from our audience about our two guests today. But if you do have more, please feel free to drop those uh, into the comment section on the CRS Facebook page. And we'll definitely leave some time at the end of this conversation to get to those. So Malcolm Gladwell, most people probably know you first and foremost as an author, a journalist, and a public speaker. You're a longtime staff writer for The New Yorker, and of course, the author of several New York Times bestselling books, as well as a host and writer of revisionist history. But what our running audience will probably also know about you is that you're an avid fan and participant of our wonderful sport. You now reside in New York City, but you spent a lot of your childhood in Southern Ontario competing in the OFSA and Ontario club scenes, as well as at that national level developmental stage with those meets like the uh, Royal Canadian Legion Championships alongside Mr. Dave Reed. And you competed for a long time, or you competed for a time at the University of Toronto for the Varsity Blues, but I understand that you then took a step back uh, from serious training before getting back into it over the last several years. And you're actually gonna participate in our STWM 5K virtual race, but I understand that you've suffered a bit of a calf injury. How are you feeling? Well, I, I tested it out uh, on the weekend and got two miles in and uh, it, it, my calf went bad again. So I'm on the shelf um, for a little bit, but I don't think it's a serious injury. I, I can still um, cross train. So I, I, th I think I'll be back up running in about two weeks. Okay. Well, personally, we're quite sad that you couldn't uh, participate in our STWM event, but we're glad to hear that you're on the mend and we wish you a very speedy recovery. Um, Malcolm, I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about what running looks like for you these days, calf injury aside, um, mm -hmm. and if you're training maybe for any virtual events or if you've just sort of been running for your own sanity during COVID, what has that looked like for you? Uh, well, I, I, um, 
you know, as you said, I, I, I took a long, I, I ran only sporadically for 30 years. And then I started training seriously again when I was 50. And I was, I run a lot. I mean, I run, I mean, for given that I am now 57. So um, I was in really good shape uh, up until my calf injury. I was probably, uh, you know, in 18 minute 5K uh, shape. Um, and so running, you know, five days a week, uh, I love track work, so, and hill work. So I do, you know, one a long run on Sunday, you know, a slow run, a tempo run, and then some track work. I mean, I, I train, it's not, doesn't sound that different from the training I was doing when I was in high school, only it's a lot slower. <laughs> <laughs> well, you say a lot slower, but I will say, regardless of age, there are many listeners right now who would love to be able to run an 18 minute 5k at any point in their running careers. Mm -hmm. And we, we will leave some time to chat a little bit more about, uh, about your current running now, but it's, it's great that you've continued to mix it up that way. And obviously, uh, have that little bit of return to your high school yeah. days with the track running. That's wonderful. I also understand that you competed, uh, in the fifth Avenue mile. Uh, not that long ago. I've done, uh, I've done it, uh, I think three or four times in the last uh, seven years, um, maybe four times. And I, I broke five minutes, I think four years ago. So that was my, um, that was the high watermark. Uh, but the effort was so painful that I, I doubt if I could do it again. <laughs> it was pretty taxing. <laughs> that sounds about age. right. Yeah, to run that fast. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think outside of the 800, the mile is about as painful as events can get, eh? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I want to shift a little bit here. Dave, you and Malcolm go way back to the late 70s for your competitors, at a, as I mentioned, OFSA and the Provincial Club Championships here in Ontario. And Dave, you went on to set a Canadian 1500 meter record. You competed on the international scene. But before any of that, you and Malcolm towed several 1500 meter start lines together as young teenagers. And I know that following your high school careers, you lost touch for a number of years until you discovered a photo, which we've now dubbed the photo from those high school running days. Um, and this is the photo that's been circulating a lot on social media as of late as we've promoted this chat. But Dave, can you tell us about the story of finding that photo and about reconnecting with Malcolm as a result? Yeah, sure. Well, I was going through a, a box of I guess old mag old magazines and articles, and that one came up, and I'm thinking this is after Malcolm became a little bit famous all of a sudden after not hearing anything from him for years, I, maybe after his first book came out. So I decided to scan it, look up how to get a hold of Malcolm Gladwell, found his email, scanned it, sent it over, said I want a rematch, and not that long after he replied, and his his reply was, no, you kicked my ass. <laughs> True. <laughs> and um, so that's how it started after, I don't know, 20 something years. Uh, and it was probably a few years later till we reconnected again. Uh, I was coming to New York City for the marathon and I looked him up and, and from there, that's where we met up again and went for a run. I think, unless I'm mistaken, so this is a photo that was taken, I think at the Ontario Championships in 1978, age class. Right. And I think it ran on the front page of the Toronto Star, not the front page of the sports section, the front page of the whole newspaper. Well, I, you're, yeah, you're right on right? all those accounts. I don't know about the front page of the whole newspaper, yeah. um, because what I did was there was no date on it. So I flipped over the backside and there was some NFL scores. Oh, that it was preseason was... pre NFL. So I went back, looked at who it was, what date, sure enough. And then later on, uh, a fellow by the name of John Carson then went to the Toronto Star and John Carson actually was in our Legion Championships representing uh, Nova Scotia at the time. So he went and then got all the details from the Star and made it even yeah. more. Oh, it was the sports section then, yes. But still it was on the front page of the sports the front section. Page of Toronto Star, that's correct. Which was, which was quite something of that. And I would also, it, you know, I should point out that I won that race. This well, is I didn't a any results, but I, <laughs> I do have a log book and it says I finished second. Yes, that's right. Well, it's, and uh, it's it's the it's the high watermark of my running career because I think it's the last time. Is it the last time we? No, it's not the last time we ever raced, but it it, it may well be the last time I ever beat you. It was, awesome. and I was. But the, the, the one you talk the one you talk about was probably it was two months earlier at the Ontario High School Championship final, yeah. Asa, yeah. when now th those those results I could find, and you beat me by one tenth of a second in the fifteen hundred. Yeah, 405 yeah. one to 405 two. That's right. The, the odd thing about our running career is that 
so I did, I, I believe I beat you three times over 1500 meters. And every time I beat you, I considered it a fluke because I was aware, even then I was aware that Dave was way better than me. I don't know, it's this weird thing I think you have, particularly at that age when you're a kid, when you're doing sports, you instinctively know who the good one is. And I knew I was living on borrowed time. I was like, this is some fluky thing that's happened. It's gonna, and I, and I, it's not gonna last this long, but I have a little window here. And then sure enough, I was absolutely correct. Um, I, I remember at, I ran a little bit in, in, in university and I remember seeing Dave at the York University track doing a workout and it was, he was running so insanely fast. I was like, holy mackerel, did I get lucky to have beaten this guy. <laughs> he was, he was, you were doing some workout and I've, I've never seen a workout like that before in my life. It was some incredible, like, I don't remember what you were doing, 400s or 800s. I was like, just, I just remember standing by the track, just in awe that any human being could go around it that fast, so. Well, so I'm, I'm curious about this because, you know, Malcolm, you say it was a fluke, but you, and, and Dave is the first to admit this, you beat him quite a few good times at some pretty high level meets, although, you know, not by a large margin, often, you know, tenths of a second, if that. Yeah. So it sounds like there was this sort of really friendly rivalry between you two. What was that like towing the line? Like, were you always kind of eyeballing each other? You, you see that now, right? I, I guess you've seen it forever. Uh, especially at OFSA. OFSA, you know, for our, our non-Ontario listeners, is basically that the national championships at the junior level. It sometimes means more than the national championships. So what was that like for you two lining up and, and knowing that you were each other's sort of main competition? Okay. Go ahead, you go first. Well, <laughs> to tell you the truth, we were, that was my first high school championships where Malcolm beat me. So I didn't even know who he was. When, when Like, you don't know each other. There's no internet. There's no instantaneous results you just show up and do it you know now thinking nowadays if I knew who he was and how he ran maybe I would have run differently but back then you just showed up and raced whoever showed up you didn't even know anything about him I would have known him later on when we raced against each other later that summer at the Ontario championships and that picture by the way is at Etobicoke Centennial Stadium um, which I was at again just this morning so it's uh, it's a place hmm. that, that's well, you you know we I had an advantage because your results, am I wrong? That your results in kind of regional championships and things in high school would have been in the Toronto papers, but yeah. my results would not have been. So I actually knew, I, I was tracking you before those races back then, because I was looking to see who was winning the, you know, the midget 1500 in the Toronto area high school, you know. Uh, so I was, a, I was aware the whole time that, that you were my principal um, uh, competitor, um, particularly after, um, uh, particularly uh, before Offset, because we had met, remember, the summer before in Sudbury yeah. at the Legion Championships. And that's the first time we met over 1,500 meters. But okay. then I was fully aware that you were, that you were the one I had to beat um, at, at, uh, uh, in the, at Offset that year. So you weren't following each other on Twitter at this point? <laughs> yes, there's, there's no still not. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, so well, well, the funny thing is, I mean, you, you talk about these, this high school rivalry that you had at OFSA and at the Ontario Championships, but then, and you started to mention this, Malcolm, you went on to actually become Ontario teammates at that Legion National Championships, which is, again, one of the sort of highest level developmental meets of, of that age group. And um, Dave, you've actually got some pretty funny stories that I think, you know, anyone can read a biography on Malcolm Gladwell or Dave we read, but there are some stories that have come out of that era that I think only you you would know and I'm, I'm hoping that to the best of your ability you might be able to share some of that intel to some of those personal stories from those legion meets going back into the uh the ages of about 14. well my yeah. there's two there's many good stories i'll tell one of them i know the one dave's going to tell the one i remember which i've never forgotten is what we went we went two years to the legion together yeah. um one year it was in um uh st john's newfoundland in 19, and this year at the 1979, the year after. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Chris Brewster, who was a, went on to have a great career as yeah. a Canadian runner. Chris, Dave and I would go for runs in the morning. And one morning we went for a run through the streets of St. John's and to Signal Hill, which as you know, is basically straight up. I mean, it's as steep, a, a steep as hills get. It's the great landmark in St. John's. And Chris and Dave ran it backwards 
And I thought, I just zipped up it. And I looked, I was like, I'm, that's just nuts. I am not running. And I realized as I watched them go, that was, I actually wrote about this years later. I realized that that was the, that was why they were better runners than I was. That I just, there were just some things I just wasn't going to do. Whereas, you know, Dave and Chris were like, that was the challenge and they were going to, they were going to, you know, uh, meet it and destroy it. And they did it. They like ran up the steepest hill imaginable backwards. And I stayed at the bottom and like realized that I was never going to be the runner they were. Dave, I think you said, we were chatting about this, that exact story before this. And you said something like, uh, you said, we're going to race. And Malcolm said, and I'm going to go home. <laughs> something like that. That's yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, right. The, the year prior to that, we were um, in Peace Gardens, Manitoba. So that's on the Manitoba, North Dakota border. And two things that, remind, that I remember most about that was we showed up you know, we showed up in, in, in it's a week long activity. They have like coaching seminars and things for the athletes. So we got there, we showed up at this track, but we looked at each other and saw the guy working. I said, where's the, where's the stadium? You're here. So it was a dirt track with a forest in the middle. And there was a guy pushing a, uh, like a roller to flatten the track down. And we kind of <laughs> looked at each other and like, this is it. But um, it, sure enough, it worked out and we all ran and the funny thing was the, the, the officials who had the time events that started on the far side of the track, like the 200 meters, would start their watch and then sprint through the forest to the finish line to get the finish line times. It was pretty bizarre. And the other story about that now, I don't know if you were with us, Malcolm, but I think you were. Yeah. We, exit, we were out walking one day, a bunch of us, and we uh, maybe hopped the fence and walked along. Next thing we know, the U.S. Border Patrol came and picked us up. Yeah, I was there. Yes. Brought us yeah. into the customs. I still remember seeing a picture of Jimmy Carter on the wall uh -huh. and, you know, kind of interrogated. We're just like, hey, we're just out looking for some burgers and fries. Like, what do you, and, you know, <laughs> so it was harmless, but it was, thinking back, it's, I don't know if you I, get away with it today. I signed a, we just signed our names in a book and I signed a fake name. <laughs> what did you like, sign, Malcolm? I don't remember, but I was like, I'm not putting my real name down. Like, they don't know who I am. I'm yeah. not going <laughs> to. Well, that could, we, yeah. went, we went for a run. We, we knew there was this excellent place to get uh, fast food that was across the border. So we, we actually went for a run, a good run. We hopped, part of the run, we hopped the fence. Like literally at that point, the border is a low fence, yeah. which we hopped over and like went down the road to get, you know, a burger somewhere. It was really, I, yeah, I remember that as well. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah, so. So, so maybe it was intentional. You heard there was a good spot on the south side of the border for some burgers and fries. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you for sharing that. I'm sure there are many more stories, which we will not ask you to tell right now, but <laughs> those are some wonderful hijinks from back in the days. Now, of course, after your high school days, uh, your paths sort of went in, in different directions. Dave went on to compete at the first ever World Track and Field Championship, set a Canadian record, almost qualify for the Olympics. And then, you know, sort of since retiring from that elite, elite racing scene, uh, Dave, you haven't raced as much and you've had a few health issues that have set you back from that. On the other hand, Malcolm, you went on to the University of Toronto and you raced a bit there, but again, you had a bit of a step back from high level, the high level racing scene. I'm wondering if you can tell us more about that because you obviously had tremendous talent in high school and it sounds like you really enjoyed it. So what was the reason for, for putting running on the back burner at that point for you? Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I think I had the wrong attitude about running. I, I got really in high school obsessed with the idea that the only reason to run was if you could win the race that you were running, which, uh, you know, and then when you stop winning the races, what do you, you're left with nothing. I didn't have a, an alternate way of a uh, healthier way of making sense of running. And then what happened when I got older was I, I sort of embraced the idea that it's fine to be running is so inherently fun. It's fine to be mediocre. Although my pride tells me I'm not mediocre, but I no longer win the races that I, run it and it doesn't bother me. I just enjoy the act of running. And that was very liberating. I, I joined a, a track club uh, here in New York when I was 50 and no one asked me uh, what I did, how old I was, what my running history was. No one cared whether I was fast or slow. Some of the people in the, in the club were not fast at all. We're like, we had four hour, five, four and a half hour marathoners in the club. And we treat everyone was considered to be a serious runner and taken, you know, and 
everyone treated each other with respect. And I just, it was this beautiful thing that like, oh, like you don't have to always try to win every race. That's not what running is about. And that just opened the door. And then, then I just plunged back in and I, it's been the happiest seven years of running in my life. I mean, it's, uh, it's really been an extraordinary experience. Well, that's lovely. And that was actually something I was going to ask you because I've, I've read various quotes of yours uh, sort of around this topic, talking about now that I'm a mediocre runner, I realize being that a mediocre runner is actually even more fun. And you, you use the word liberating there. It's, I, I'm, I'm wondering, is that sort of what gets you up and gets you motivated each day? I mean, to, to still be in the shape and, you know, understanding that you have a lot of inherent talent, but to still be in the shape to run an 18 minute 5k at 57 years old, no disrespect intended, it, there, there's a certain level of passion and commitment that must remain all these years later. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about that love for the sport that you've maybe rediscovered, it sounds like, in the last decade. Yeah. Well, I just, I've never gotten over the, um, just the act, even when I was a little kid, the act of running was something that I found incredibly pleasurable. Um, and uh, it, just the knowledge, too, that I, it's the thing that I'm, you know, everyone has something that they do well, that they feel like their body is built to do. And that this is just what my, I feel like my body was built to do. Um, and, and, and once I can sort of, once I realize that that's what it was about, just that simple pleasure, um, then it's, then I've, uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's been a, um, a joyous experience again for mm. me. Um, well, and you know that again, that's beautiful and, and the joy is so important, but also you're <laughs> just given the, the level that you're running at, do you have any aspirations about setting any age group records or do you have like specific goals on the horizon or are you really just enjoying the act of running right now? No, there's, there's these, there's these guys. So I'm pretty good, but there is always this group of people who are my age or older who run not just a little bit faster than me, so much faster <laughs> that, that it's pointless. Like in the fifth Avenue mile, there's a guy, there's like two guys who run in my age group who run not I run at best just around five minutes who run like 440 like I you know I mean it's pointless to try and catch them like that's not happening but is and it like do, do you ever have that drive to sort of like it sounds like you're just sort of running for fun like if you really honed in on this again not that you have anything else in your life going on that would distract you from that you know yeah. <laughs> but, no, if you think about do you ever have that goal these are people who I imagine when they were 25 were like a day's level so when they're you know, that's an order of magnitude faster than me. So when those guys are 55, they're still an order of magnitude faster than me, right? They're still going to kick my butt. There's just, there's no, there is no point to, and they would, there is no joy in trying to be with them, right? It's like, it's just, then it becomes a grind and torture. It's, it should be fine for me to go out and just, just um, compete at the level that I, that I feel comfortable at. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I will yeah. say to many of you know, um, Paul Kemp, the mm -hmm. Canadian runner, Paul Kim, who came to see me. And just before I got injured, we went for a run. And I'm just going to boast here. I took him from my favorite path through the town cemetery. And I dropped him. He actually, after four miles, he's like, I've had enough. And I was so pleased with myself. I was like, I, I, I destroyed Paul Kim. <laughs> that, Malcolm, that sounds like the story when I first showed up, the first time I've seen you in 30 years, in New York. And I said, OK, let's just go for a 40 minute run. It was during the New York City Marathon weekend. I remember that. So we went along the Hudson. I want to get to 20 minutes. Malcolm's picking up the pace. Uh, and I said, we can turn around. No, no, another five minutes. And 10 minutes later, listen, okay, we turn around now. Starts picking up the pace. And I'm like, well, I can't say it, but you know what I'm thinking. But to finish off that part of the story, I hadn't, after that, you know, we chatted, was another few years. In the meantime, I said, I better do a little running next time before I go to New York. Yeah. Yeah. So I invited him. We met in Central Park. We went for a run around the hilly six-mile loop. And the only thing Malcolm said at the end was, I guess we're even. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I remember that run. So this is, there's that, there's that, you know, the running cliche, talent doesn't go away. So Dave gets in shape, comes back to New York. We go for this six-mile loop around Central Park. And I remember like halfway into it, it's like, oh, he, you know, this is why he's the world-class runner and I'm not. He's like gliding along, chat. he wouldn't stop talking. I was like, will you stop talking? I am completely out of breath. He's like chatting along, chatting, and like charging the hills and like blowing past 22 year olds and just like, oh my goodness. I was so happy when that was over. 
Yeah. I'm very glad to hear that even in uh, small ways, that competitive edge and that competitive fire continues to burn bright. <laughs> That's quite fun. Well, and you're, you're both, obviously, you've, you've competed at high levels in, in respective uh, categories, both of you throughout uh, your careers, but you've also remained huge fans of the sport. And, you know, we've seen this just incredible resurgence of Canadian elite road running over the last decade. It's been so exciting. I mean, we saw the Canadian marathon records go down on both the men's and women's side, um, multiple times on the women's side, uh, both of which had stood for decades. And we're simultaneously witnessing this global running scene improve at a truly astonishing rate. I mean, this seems to be the, the year of the world records from Gide and Cheptegei just a few days ago breaking their world records uh, for the 5,000 and 10,000. Of course, Kipchoge breaking uh, two, two hours in the marathon, albeit not on an official race. I'm wondering, given how fast you both were and, and how long you've been involved in the sport. What are some of the major changes that you've both seen over the decades? And I would say maybe especially in the last five-ish years that you can attribute to these huge leaps in uh, Canadian and global performances. Uh, are you want to choose the side or? <laughs> we well, and that's an important piece of it, right? I mean, obviously shoes are, are part of sort of the technological revolution and, and we could get into that. That could be a whole other conversation, but maybe some of the major changes that you've seen and, and shoes certainly, but, but maybe approaches to the sport, other types of technology or science advances, mindset, anything that you've really seen that stood out for you as, as significant changes. Well, for me, I mean, I really haven't left the sport in all these years. So if I compare it to a long time ago, there's, for sure, the attitudes about the training is, have changed. And I would think, I think just in general, the, the, you know, your people have exercise physiologists and, and besides their coach and they have uh, physical therapists and, and these people are now more experienced, they're more knowledgeable. And, uh, you know, you see all these athletes now carrying around form, form rollers and they're a lot, they have a lot, they're a lot more aware of their body and how it works and what they need to do to stay healthy which is the key, obviously, uh, to be consistent. And I think that's the, that's the biggest difference. And I think, you know, with the more experienced coaches and knowledgeable coaches and all the way down the line, it's gone to the athletes. And, and I think for sure that has a major impact on what's been happening. Dave, I remember when I bought my first altitude tent and I told you about it and you kind of laughed and you said, yeah, altitude tent, huh? Back in the day, all we did was sit up some push-ups, and that got me to a Canadian record. <laughs> so yeah. Things have changed a little bit. Um, Malcolm, what have you seen as some of the major advancements in our sport yeah. that have led yeah. to these performances? Well, I've been, I mean, I, like everyone, I've been <clears throat> tracking this Canadian resurgence, particularly on the women's side. Um, I remember I would, we used to run against Gabriella Stafford's dad, Jamie Stafford. So I knew him from way back when. And there was the summer when she was breaking every record in sight. I would, I would email him every time uh, his daughter broke a record. And I felt like I'm, all of a sudden I was emailing him like every week. Weekly, kind of yeah. And I would watch those races and her and Laura Muir and all those run, runners. And I realized, that I think there's a mindset shift, which is that a lot of people... I think there was um, a lot of people from countries like Canada or Scotland or what have you um, in the last generation got discouraged <clears throat> and felt like they couldn't compete at the international level. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's been a, a, like a switch has just been flipped. And if you, when I would watch a, a Gabriella Stafford race, what's fascinating to me is that it's clear that she thinks she can win. I mean, she's not, she's not kind of drafting along trying to get a, you know, a personal best and come in fourth. She actually, same thing with Laura Muir. Laura Muir runs every single race like she's going to win. And that's like, that. I, don't, I could be wrong. My sense is that's different from 15 years ago from mm -hmm. um, runners of, of from these countries. Um, and that's, that, you know, so much of this sport, as Dave can attest, is psychological. And when you have um, groups of runners now who honestly believe they have a shot at coming in first, that makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I muted myself. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's been really, really fun to watch. And uh, I think those, those it, it was, it was interesting. We actually had uh, Tristan Woodfine on another podcast that I host recently, who just uh, set the, the, or achieved Olympic standard in the marathon at the London marathon uh, for the first time and took about three minutes off. And one of the, one of the pieces of conversation topics that we had with him was 
so many of these events this year, so many of these records that we've seen have been basically completely perfectly paced time trial efforts. Um, and, and many of them solo, right? I mean, if anyone watched the NN Valencia World Record Day, it was basically the, these athletes had wave light technology as their, as their accompaniment during their race, as opposed to actual people racing them. And one of the conversations we had is, is 2021 going to be significantly slower because we're going to come hopefully back to this world where everyone's competing against each other and it's sort of this like chess match evolving in real time, or because everyone has set these world records and really pushed themselves to these higher levels, will we see even faster chess matches happening. Do you have any thoughts on what we might see moving forward in terms of how this year has been so different from years that we've seen in the past? Either of you. I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead. Uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen next year. I just know that, you know, traditionally in the championship races, people don't run for time. They run to win. That's not to say people won't, you know, look at what's been happening this year and see these records broken and, and uh, you know, move the bar. They, they have to, they have to adjust their training a little bit, thinking if they want to be the best, if they want to beat the world record holders, they've got to run that fast. And I agree with Malcolm, like it for sure that the bars moved, the, the, the attitude of the people has changed and they're, they, th they feel like they can win now. And, and uh, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen next year after watching all these records go down this year. But actually, I'm looking forward to a championship races to tell you the truth. I mean, I don't mind watching these, uh, set up races, but I love watching championship races. I know you're a big fan of those, Dave. <laughs> How about you, Malcolm? Any thoughts on what we might see moving forward based on this year? Yeah, I don't, I mean, it's just a reset. Like when I think back when I was growing up in the seventies, there's no way a Canadian would be talking about on, the, on the men's side, no Canadian man would be in a, in a world championship or Olympic final and say the 5,000, right? right? And then now we have, didn't, what did Mohammed run? 1247? 1247. He, and he was on the podium last year at the World Championships. And on the podium last year in the World Championship. And like, that is like, that just radically readjusts your, now I, you know, now I wouldn't be surprised at all to see that happen again. Um, so that's a kind of, um, uh, I think the question of what the times are is less important than, um, you know, uh, uh, than the, than the, the order of finish. Um, I, it, you know, we may well slow it for all kinds of good reasons or bad reasons or what have you, but I just think it's a, um, all kinds of people are now in the, in the running who weren't before. And that's, um, that's to me the, to me, the most interesting race of, uh, of the last couple of years was a time trial on the Nike campus. I think it was last summer yeah. where like a bunch of people who you never thought would break 13 broke 13. Including yeah. Matt Centrowitz, like <laughs> Matt Centrowitz could run 13 minutes in the five feet. I'm like, oh my goodness! And then, and then the guy Woody Woody Kincaid runs 12:58. I'm like, but just that, you know, it made you realize there's a bunch of people out there who can do things that would surprise you, given the right um, circumstance. Uh, that was a real. When that happened, I was like, oh, yeah, I had this little sense, a premonition that the floodgates are about to open. Absolutely. Well, and on that note, you know, we, we've seen some of these floodgates opening uh, just with, with the Toronto Waterfront Marathon in general. I mean, that's where both the women's and, and men's Canadian uh, marathon records went down twice on the women's side. Um, of course, Cam, Lemon, Cam, Cam Levin's beating it on the men's side and then these incredible performances with the likes of Trevor Hoffbauer. Both of you, I know, again, have remained very keen uh, fans of the sport. And Dave, you've remained really deeply involved in the Canadian running scene as an integral part of the STWM weekend over the years. I'm wondering if you can share some of your favorite memories from this event from the past several years. Well, yes, you're right about that. I, from the beginning, I think 30 years ago, I was involved with Alan Brooks, who owns the series and puts it on, does an amazing job, by the way. And in the early days, I was the guy doing the technical core stuff, like going to city hall, going to see the, the, the police, the barricade people, and you know, putting out the route, doing all that, um, back when we had a skeleton crew. And more recently, I'm just uh, work with the athletes on the elite side, you know, dealing with the pace cars there and the pacers and all the elites and what happens up there. So I used to just get to sit in the lead pace vehicle all these times. And that's why a couple of years back when we knew cameras running and I, and I had a feeling from his uh, conversations a month out that he was going to get the record. I actually emailed Malcolm and invited him onto the uh, lead truck, but he couldn't make it that day. But, um, and of course, Mel, um, Cam did go on to, to set the record that day. 
Cam, my, my, um, he's my doppelganger. Yeah, so I have a, that's right. He, he, he came to New York for Melrose and I went, I went back, back into the, just to meet him. And we have a pic, I have a picture with him it's and it's like, he looks like my little brother. <laughs> it's uncanny that picture of the two of you. I, I think there's uh, maybe some good running jeans and, and some other things going on there. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so um, speaking of STWM, you know, one of the really lovely things this year, as I mentioned, is that everything has gone virtual. So this has, um, it, it's, it's caused some challenges for people. It's obviously stopped us from running together and competing in these big city marathons the way that we all love to and miss and hopefully we'll get back to soon. But again, it's created this opportunity for us to do things in a different way and to take the entire month of October to work towards our STWM uh, virtual races. And a big part of the Toronto Waterfront Marathon for many years now has been the chair challenge. And although both of you unfortunately are not able to run as you had hoped, you're still both going to be uh, contributing to some charities. And I'd love to know what you've chosen and why those charities are important to you this year. I chose um, Sick Kids um, for purely, for me, I mean, there's not a bad charity on the list. So my, I, I was like, well, which one appeals to me? And um, that was for sentimental reasons that, um, uh, several of very, very good friends of mine um, were, have been physicians there over the years. And so uh, I just, and so I know, you know, I have a little kind of insight, a little bit of insight into the institution and what a wonderful place it is. And I just thought it would be lovely to, to give them, um, uh, give them uh, my support. That's wonderful. Well, and again, that's, that's very appreciated. Dave, which charity have you chosen? Well, I've chosen the uh, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. The reason being is a um, good friend of mine, who's a hockey player, Max Domi, is a spokesperson. He's a, a type one uh, diabetic himself, found out when he was 12. Uh, and I've just watched him over the years get through that, now make it to the NHL, uh, by the way, with a new contract. And um, he's just so inspirational to the, you know, to the kids that find out, first day they find out that they have diabetes and they wonder how they're gonna survive. And Max, you know, living proof that you can thrive, not just survive with this disease and uh, he's great inspiration. And, and I get to see Max every now and every now and then training and believe it or not, he, he can run Malcolm. He uh, yesterday did four by a kilometer, but yeah. you'll relate to this one. He does a workout 10 by 200 St averages about 30 seconds. Last one, wow. 24. So are you serious? He can run. So, yep. There you go. So, oh my goodness. Yeah, he's a, yeah. Very well. He's, he's trained by former, Olympic champion Mark McCoy in the hurdles, who's oh yeah yeah yeah, of mine, and I see Mark almost every morning when we work out together. Uh, so yeah, so he's got a good a good coach in in uh, McCoy, and 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 Max is a very fit athlete. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you both gentlemen for choosing those charities. Again, we would have had a bit of a running challenge here had you both been healthy, but uh, given what I know of Dave's training, maybe next time we'll have to do, Malcolm will do some, some running and Dave will have to do some combination of sit-ups and push-ups and some med ball stuff. And we'll find an equation there where it can be sort of equal because I think- well, Bring the distance fun. down. Right. Yeah, right. Well, that too. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, again, Malcolm and Dave have chosen the Sick Kids Hospital Foundation and the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. They are only two on a long list of the charities that you can choose from on the Scotiabank Charity Challenge for this month's STWM. There are still uh, registration spots available to register for events throughout this month and also to get on those charity challenge uh, opportunities. So check out the list of the uh, Scotiabank Charity Challenge charities at torontowaterfrontmarathon.com. And that's where you can also register for your event for this month. Gentlemen, this has been so fun and we've taken up uh, quite a bit of your time, but we have some audience questions to get to if you're game. Sure. Fantastic. So I think, Malcolm, this first one comes from a good friend of ours, Steve Fleck, who has also hosted a number of the Runner's High events uh, earlier in this summer. And he asks, what are some of the most powerful and important life, life lessons applicable to day-to-day -day life and business that we learn from being endurance athletes? Oh, wow. Uh, <clears throat> well, I guess, I mean, it's, the one that always strikes me is, um, the amount of, uh, it teaches you patience that you, you know, you, there's absolutely nothing in endurance sports that comes quickly, uh, that 
preparation is measured in months, if not years. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, in today's world, that kind of message is, uh, is quite radical, right? Where everybody wants um, something to happen overnight. Um, I kind of love that fact that you, it unfolds really, 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 really slowly. Mm -hmm. And and methodically too, right? I mean, Malcolm, I, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot here, but you've been interviewed in the past and said that running with music is for people who are soft. <laughs> it sounds like sort of- I love but... ragging on people who, who have uh, who got things in their ears. Yeah, it's like soft, like, come on. Are you, that, are you that terrified of being with your own thoughts for an hour? Give me a break. But I think that really speaks to what you're talking about with the patients too, right? That you'd really have to just be okay with being with yourself. Um, for these long stretches of time and seeing incremental change. Yeah, that's yeah. lovely. Dave, do you have anything to add to that? Any life lessons that we learned from being endurance athletes? First of all, that was a great answer. I enjoyed listening to that. <laughs> um, no, probably along the similar, it's just not only patience, but it, for sure it's, it's, it's the discipline and it's finding out what's really inside you. Do you have the drive to, to do what you want to do? It teaches you that, that you, if, if you work long enough and hard enough, you can accomplish good things. And so going back again to, with this instantaneous, instantaneous society of ours that just everybody wants gratification right away, it teaches you to, to work through things and, and you know, get over the little injuries or sicknesses or setbacks you have in your training to move forward to accomplish your goals. Mm -hmm. Dave, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with you for a minute here. What advice would you give to someone who's just getting into running today? Because of course, you haven't only achieved some of the highest level of running in Canada, but you've also uh, been a fabulous coach for myself and many others. So what piece of advice would you give young runners? I think, yeah, I would have to know at what age they were, like whether they were young, starting off grade school, high school, or somebody, you know, starting, off, starting again, maybe in their 40s. Uh, but it would go back to, I, well, probably find a good mentor, coach, or trainer, someone who has experience and is willing and to work with you and to explain what, what your career, what this is going to look like. And I think that's important because some people get, they just jump in and start doing things and they're not sure. I'm sure there's an internet, they can check things out. But I think having, having an experienced coach or someone that can really relate to what you're doing would be most beneficial. Mm -hmm. Well, I can attest to that, having had yourself and a few other wonderful people in my life coach me over the years, it's certainly very important. Malcolm, um, I think this one is for you and it sort of fits in well with a revisionist history, but if you could go for a run with any runner in history, who would it be? Other than Dave, <laughs> although Dave's too fast for me. So uh, who would I go with any runner in history? Such an interesting question. Uh, Probably like, well, I'm a big fan of those English runners from the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Steve Ovad or, not the 70s, I was just going to say the 80s too, but Steve Ovad and Sebco and all those guys. But also, I mean, I would love to go, you mean in their prime, like to have gone for a run with like, uh, you know, Joan, uh, Joan, Joan Benoit Samuelson in her prime as a marathoner or Paula Radcliffe. I don't know, like when they were like, on fire back in the day. I don't think that would be kind of super inspiring. Absolutely. Dave, how about you? Who would you like, other than Malcolm, if you could go for a run with anyone in history, who would it be? Well, I did. I trained with my hero, John Walker, for two months down in, in Auckland, New Zealand, 1988. Right. And it was unbelievable. And I realized uh, there was one part I tell you, we were, there's a famous course in Auckland uh, up these mountains, the Waitakere Mountains. And it was a 16 or 18 mile long run. And you go up this hill and you round the bend and you go up another hill and you round a bend and you go up and it just kept going. And I looked at him, I said, no wonder you got the gold medal because he was Olympic champion in 1976 and uh, world, former world record holder in the mile, first guy to break um, 350 in the mile. Yeah, he was my hero. And I, got the chance to do it. I, I had no idea you trained with, that's fantastic. I lived at his house for two months. Every day oh. we ran together. Oh my God. Amazing. So what kind of, wait, I, you, can't, you can't let this go so quickly. <laughs> what, sort of, what sort of track work were you doing? I got it all in my logbook if you want. <laughs> <laughs> just, so you, just so everyone knows, Dave's logbooks are not only meticulous, but he has kept them all. I've seen every, oh, uh, well, man. not probably every logbook, but almost every logbook, every newspaper clipping, every photo. It's, it's, it's quite impressive. You should start a little museum, Dave. That's incredible. 
We'll talk later about the workouts, Malcolm. But yeah, it was some <laughs> right. and he, he was tough as nails. That's for sure. Yeah. Malcolm, two more questions for you here. Uh, the first is a little cheeky. Did you ever reach 10,000 hours of running in high school? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Dave, how about you? I don't, I never counted, but maybe close. I did. We can tally up your logbooks. I, well, I'll tell you one thing. I did have a running streak that I had in high school and I didn't miss a day of running minimum two miles in four years. And I, and when I look back, not many people do that. And so I, I remember the day I didn't do, I was sick and I, I didn't go out the, the one day I broke the streak, but yeah, I would minimum two miles that I run every, every single day. So I don't know whether that added up to 10,000. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have my calculator. I wasn't smart enough to add up, but. So uh, your that. friend and, and uh, a friend of Canada running series, Walt Fayon may have something to say about 10,000 hours, but again, that's oh. a conversation for another time. <laughs> Malcolm, uh, last question. Do you have any plans to write a book specifically on or strongly related to running? No, I've always struggled to know uh, what to how, how to write about running. I don't, I, I don't know how to write. I know about how to write for runners. I don't know how to write for non-runners. Hmm. Um, and I think the only useful book would be one that appealed to people who didn't run and tried to convince them uh, to do it. Um, and I've never, I've been puzzling over that for a very long time, but it's really hard to communicate to people unless they try it for themselves. Um, that there is pleasure in doing something that's that seems and is difficult. Mm. It's just a, it's a, an incredibly, you know, I was listening to a uh, to Lance Armstrong once on a podcast talking with one of his cycling buddies from back in the day, and they were talking about um, suffering and how crucial the idea of suffering was to being a good cyclist, and how it was very hard to convince people that there was there was something. Um, <clears throat> there was joy to be found in suffering, it's fulfillment, all those kinds of things. Of course, they suffer in cycling the way that runners do not suffer. Um, and I just thought that was, that's crucial. You know, I sometimes go for runs and they're not, you know, I have, a, I have this 12 mile run I do on the weekends and it's all uphill or downhill. And it's really super insanely hard. And I would do it, you know, when it's 90 degrees out. And it's like, how do I convince someone that that's actually a fun thing to do? It's, just, it's not easy. Yeah, yeah. Dave, you've had your share of suffering through through your run training as well. What do you have to say about embracing suffering and finding joy in that? Well, I guess it all depends on what you're trying to accomplish with your running. Um, if, it is a, if it is high level, then there's no doubt about it. you have to learn how to embrace the suffering and, and know that it's going to take you to a better place. Um, for the people that are just out, uh, you know, for, you know, to maybe run a 5k or 10k. I think they, they suffer through a certain degree of that as well, but maybe not to the same extent. And yeah, you just have to, but, but I think once you do it and you get through it, even the people I see, and I, and I talk to the running community all the time, the people that are first getting involved, they're not too sure what's happening. And, you know, they get through their first long run, they get through a few workouts and then you're kind of addicted. They're like, okay, it wasn't that bad. I can, I can do that again, or I can get better. So yeah, and I agree with Malcolm. Sometimes you have to go through it to see that, well, it's not that bad. And, you know, just ask for more. Well, and again, so much of that joy is retroactive, right? You may not be experiencing the sense of pure joy in the moment, but afterwards a sense of accomplishment. I mean, I've been on many a long run where I wake up dreading it in the morning and by the end of that 25 hard K, I'm, I'm spent, but it's, it's been one of the most enjoyable, you know, hour and a half that I've, that I've spent in my week. So I think all of the runners listening right now will be able to relate in some, in some way. And I think that's a lovely note to leave it on because uh, as all of our runners prepare for their virtual STWM events, regardless of the distance from 5k all the way up to the marathon. And then Malcolm, we have something called the whole shebang this year, where throughout the month of October, you run a 5k, 10k, half marathon and full marathon and submit your results. Uh, those are the true sort of gluttons for pain. But for anyone uh, participating in whatever distance you may be throughout the month of October, we wish you the very best of luck. We hope that you are able to embrace the suffering as Dave and Malcolm have suggested. Gentlemen, thank you so much for sharing your time and your insights with us. I feel like this could be twice as long, but we won't keep you any longer. Thank you both so much. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Once again, you can still register for your STWM virtual event by visiting torontowaterfrontmarathon.com. Please uh, consider signing up also 
for the Scotiabank Charity Challenge, either for the Sick Kids Hospital Foundation, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, as Malcolm and Dave have chosen, or any of the hundreds of other charities listed there. Um, and for all of those competing this weekend at the AC42K Relay or any of your virtual events, we wish you the best of luck. Continue to post your results on social media. We will be cheering and following along virtually. Until next time, thank you all for tuning in. This has been Runners High with Malcolm Gladwell, Dave Reed, and myself, Kate Van Buskirk.